Hello and welcome to the show. We call this one Molotsky on Money. What's this show all about? Well, the clues are in the title. We'll be discussing money specifically, investment strategies, taxes, estate planning, insurance, and many other topics, all of it designed to help you and your family improve your overall financial picture. The Molotsky part of our title comes from our panel. Their name is Molotsky. Each week, we'll have Stan Molotsky, president and founder of the SHM Financial Group, as well as Lee Molotsky, vice president of the SHM Financial Group. So stay tuned because we have valuable information on each show. Tonight is no exception that we hope you and your family and everyone can benefit from. Stan, before we get into the topic, I want to explain because we kind of been doing this now for several weeks, and I want to explain to the audience what exactly does your firm do? What do you and Lee and the people at SHM Financial do for people when it comes to their finances? Well, the main goal the main, main objective is to make sure that they have a balanced position and that they constantly adjust it based on their goals, objectives, risk tolerance, health, and what they basically want to do with their money and to make sure that they do not at any point in time ever be in a position not to be able to have money so that they don't outlive their money. So basically what you do is you try to help them as much as you can avoid mistakes. Is that a fair statement, Lee? Yeah, we kind of act as their coach. Right. I mean, we don't own the team, it's their team, but we're, we're their coach, their guidance counselor, their uh, hand holder, kind of drifting, uh, kind of guiding them through the forest. So in that, in that role of helping them to avoid mistakes, we thought that it would be a good idea to do a show on common mistakes that people make and we would go over them so that we remind them not to do this. But of course, people are going to do it. <laughs> well, there's some of the things that are so obvious that you assume people are aware of, but sometimes it's good to just get it out on the table. Right. And the first one we're going to do, and this one, we could probably do several shows on this one alone, and that is not getting professional advice. Well, it's like, you know, you don't feel well. Uh, what do you do? Uh, you ask your wife, what should I do? Right. Or you then, if it gets to that point, you go to a doctor. And the doctor prescribes and does a variety of different things after giving you an examination. This is basically what we do. They come to ice, us, they don't feel well about where their portfolio and where their goals and objectives are taking them. And our job, Lee and I, and the other people at our firm, is to basically sit down, go over the different things that they're doing, point out to them, what they're doing properly and what they're doing not properly and then make adjustments. Lee, it's like what Stan said, it's like going to the doctor. Now, how many times have your people said, I went to the doctor, he gave me a pill, and I didn't, I didn't feel like taking it. <laughs> so in some cases... <laughs> I need this operation, right. nah, I'm not going to bother. Right. <laughs> so, or, or I'll operate on myself. Yeah, Th those that, are the, those are the self-medicating people. That's that, yes. I mean, they, and that's okay, a lot, of, very, a lot of very smart people try to manage their own money. So. When we sit down with them, we have a, a, a two to three pages worth of questions that we try and ask them to understand where it is they're coming from. And after 45 minutes to an hour, a lot of people realize even though they've done a nice job planning some of their money, they really don't have maybe all but a, a third to half of those questions answered. And then they start to realize maybe they don't know exactly what they're doing to encompass all their plans. How do you get people, and either one of you can answer this, how do you get people to understand that the need or the service that you provide or any financial advisor provides, how do you get them to understand that? Well, it, it's, it's a process. You just have to point out the different things, like Lee said, that what, this is what you're doing, and have you looked at doing it this, 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 and this way, and sometimes they'll say, I didn't even know that existed. And I said, well, that's not your function. That's our job is to look at all the different options that there are and then present them to you. And that's the beauty of our entity. I mean, different entities do different things, but we're a totally independent entity. And therefore, we don't have a specific product line or any product line. Our job is to then go and find that 
to which makes the most sense for the client at that particular time. And it's always constantly in a state of flux and changing as the world changes. Okay, we're talking tonight here on the show on Molotsky on Money about avoiding these common mistakes when it comes to your finances. And we have another one. We have several of them for you tonight. You may want to write these down to make sure you avoid them. I love this one. If married, not figuring out who's responsible for what. Stan, you want to explain this one? Well, again, it, it, you know, w when I started in this business a long time ago, it used to be that the husband was working and the wife was home uh, raising the children. As the world evolves, now you find that the wife and the husband, most of the time, are both working. So it's a different change of what has to happen and what the responsibilities are. But I always was of the concept, and my father <laughs> preached this to me, it basically if you create a program, married, and you set up your asset base, one third, one third, one third, and you basically, the money that comes in, a third goes into the wife's name, a third goes into the husband's name, and a third goes into the joint account. That way, something happens, there's at least flexibility and the ability to do different things within the framework of how that money gets basically managed. And most of the time in a married couple, they don't always have the same goals and objectives and risk tolerance. Really? So, you, right. Married couples disagree? Oh, you, you wouldn't be suggesting that, would you? On occasion, that's true. <laughs> okay. That's on occasion. Okay. Lee, did you practice that when you, did you, did you take dad's advice when you got married? I'm, I'm still taking the class. Okay. <laughs> all right. All right. We're, we're all, we're learning as we go. Okay. We're talking about avoid common mistakes and we're, we're trying to give you as many as we can so that you avoid them and we suggest you write them down and that you know again in the future, maybe you happen to forget after the show, but uh, here's our next one. And this one again on the subject of marriage, who needs a prenuptial agreement? And, and this, is a, this is like a can of worms sometimes, right Stan? It can be. And again, as, as more and more couples are getting married later and they each have careers and they each have assets and they've each built up certain things, it's that much more important to just know going in what might possibly happen coming out and how that all could be divided and properly earmarked. So it's more important today than it ever has been for people to at least talk about it, to determine whether or not it makes any kind of sense to do that. We, we kind of do that without really calling it a prenuptial. Each of the, when we sit down and talk to somebody about their family's portfolio, their individual goals and objectives, et cetera, their tax bracket, we always talk about an, <coughs> excuse me, an exit strategy. So if you want to call a prenuptial an exit strategy, we really do that anyway, but ne not necessarily in a technical prenuptial. We always talk about what do you, what's the purpose of putting your money into X, Y, or Z? What are the goals and objectives here? And when are you looking to come out of this investment? What's, what's it for? So we do a form of a prenuptial in all of our planning uh, that we do, but we don't really use prenuptials because we're not a law firm. Do you find that this is a delicate subject and it might be difficult if you're talking to a client or a potential client who may be getting married or maybe the son or daughter is getting married? Do you find that might be too delicate to bring up? We don't bring that up. That, that is, like Lee said, that's a legal matter. Uh, that's something when they draft, you know, with the will and their powers of attorney that they need to have, that's something that the attorney should be bringing up. It's not our function to bring it up, but like Lee mentioned, and it's critical, especially with us and in our practice, that we want to make sure everything that we do for a client, they're aware of the exit strategy that they have to have in case things change and their situation changes, and how do they get out of whatever it is that they go into. Okay, we have plenty more to talk about here on the show. Avoiding the common mistakes when it comes to your finances, unfortunately, we have a lot more mistakes to talk to you about so that you can avoid them. With Stan and Lee Malotsky, I'm your host, John DeMassey. We're coming back with more of this version of Malotsky on Money right after these words. Don't go away. Just as it's extremely important to have your automobile's brakes tested, we think you must have some type of safety net provisions in your financial plan. How are you protecting your bond positions from rising rates? How are you protecting your stock market gains from market sell-off? Do you have the proper provisions in your financial plan to assure that your income lasts as long as you do? Are you keeping up with inflation? Call 1-800-MONEY-SHN to schedule your safety net review. 
That's 1-800-MONEY-SHN. Not everyone can endure the ups and downs of the market. When planning for retirement, you can ride the roller coaster and take your chances, or you can eliminate the downs by properly repositioning most of your portfolio. If you're five years pre-retirement or five to 10 years into retirement, it's not too late. As a matter of fact, it's never too late to avoid the next down movement. Call the SHM Financial Group at 1-800-MONEY-SHM or check us out on the web at shmfinancial.com. Welcome back to Malotsky on Money with Stan and Lee Malotsky. I'm your host, John Damasky. Don't forget, if you would like to reach Stan or Lee or any member of the SHN Financial Group at any time, feel free to call them, email them, or go on their website. We do give you that number from time to time on the screen, so you may want to jot that down, as well as jotting down these mistakes tonight, so hopefully you can avoid them, not only now, but in the near future. We're talking about avoiding common mistakes when it comes to your finances, and the next one what we have is every child or every adult child wh whatever your age is going to love this one not teaching your kids about money stan how did you teach your children about money observation <laughs> i mean okay. you know it just you know they watch they observe and uh, it's like uh, they wanted an increase in their allowance and i said what allowance you know <laughs> you know you're old enough to deliver papers you're right. get a job i mean fortunately uh they did and they from when they were 12 13 years old were in the workplace doing the things that you could do in those days today it's a little more difficult to do that but to explain to children whether they're teenagers or older the value of money and the use of money is so critical today that unfortunately they do not get that in most schools. I was going to say they really don't. Uh, Lee, your twins are two years old. Are you starting to teach them or is it too early? When When is a good well, time, do you think? We're learning m about numbers and then right. gradually we'll talk about a dollar and a quarter and a dime and a penny and what that means and then we'll get into allowances at some point and how you don't spend what you don't have. Right. So it's really important just to start early on but be, be reasonable about your approach. Right. We're talking about avoiding common mistakes when it comes to your finances and we're, we're trying to focus in on probably the most important the next one that we have and we actually did a show on this a couple of weeks ago Stan about not starting a college savings plan and or a retirement plan soon enough well it's like anything you have to start yesterday <clears throat> not tomorrow but yesterday and you have to start whether it's for college planning or whether it's for retirement planning as soon as you get that first check some of that should be put away for whether it's for college or for the retirement planning. And people always say, well, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm spending all that money, especially if you're 25, 30, 35 years old, taking care of college debts and things like that. And I always say to them, you know, you're working, you're creating some kind of income from your job, but what happens if your employer says to you, we have some layoffs we're gonna have to make, we're gonna have to cut out some people, don't worry, we're gonna keep you, but we're gonna to have to cut your salary by five to 10%. Your first step would be, oh, well, I'm glad I have my job, uh, I'll manage, and I'll be able to function. I say to them, well then make believe that's what just happened and you have five or 10% less in that check. Put that aside for the rainy day or for that retirement or when you're married and you have kids and you're just gonna put them to college. And it's amazing if you do it, how easy it is and how automatic it is, and it just automatically builds up and you turn around and you look and say, gee whiz, look what's there. The amazing, I'm sorry, the amazing thing is that we have a chart, we don't have it for today, but we'll talk about it next week maybe, about the differential between starting now or waiting a year or two or waiting five years to start. Oh, it's major, right? It's, it's major. unbelievable. Right. You have to really, we really should get that chart for the next time. but. The idea of putting money away, not necessarily a big lump sum, how do I get to a million bucks, how do I get to 500,000, but starting out every single month and just being consistent. Every about paycheck. It. Right, two questions. When do you start the college savings plan? All right, your girls are two. You started when they were born, correct? Correct. So that's the answer. If you can, start when they're born. You don't right? even have to wait. You right. could set aside. Start before they're born. Ear, it's called well, really just earmark a piece of money each, each and every month or each and every paycheck for whatever it is, just the rainy day fund, and then gradually step it up and eventually put away X number of dollars every month. And stay in a retirement plan, when do you start that? Right away, I mean, you start, again, from the beginning. The earlier you can start, the easier it is 
you know, later on. So if you're working at 17, then you, you start it. then. You do it. Okay. I mean, it's, it's hard to tell somebody hard to tell 17. a 17-year-old. <laughs> but, I mean, again, that's where the parent and the grandparent step in and say, wait a second, if you would do this now, it'll be that much easier. In fact, maybe they can even help them do it by maybe they don't have the 401k plan where they're matching, but they can have a ha family plan where the parent or the grandparent is matching what goes into that savings. Okay, we're talking about avoiding common mistakes when it comes to your finances, and we've gone over several so far, but we have more to talk about. And this one, and again, I, I think maybe some people don't understand this one, Stan, not understanding the risk of margin buying. What is that all about? Well, you can buy stock, and when you sometimes you pay 100% uh, of the purchase price of that stock, and sometimes uh, you decide, I'm going to take a little more risk, and I'm going to buy it on margin, where the brokerage entity lends you X percent of the money, and you know the margin requirement, let's say it's 50 percent, so if you're buying a stock for $10,000, you put up five, or you put up 10 and buy $20,000 worth of stock, because you're taking advantage, you think, of the cycle that is going on, and you're trying to maximize what you're going to gain. And the interesting thing, at different times within the market cycle, one of the things we always look at is what is the amount of margin buying that's going on percentage-wise. And if you go back, uh, you know, uh, a few months ago into the month of June, the margin buying was the highest it had been in quite some time uh, in the month of June of Is 20. that good or no, bad? it's not that's good. Not because good? It shows the potential when the markets revert the other way, then all of a sudden, as things fall, you get what are called margin calls, where they want more money or more stock to keep the account above water, so to speak. You're, you're really, what you're doing is using borrowed money to purchase things. Which is like a credit card, it's basically, hard enough, right? It's yeah, hard enough to do the right thing without borrowing the money to make sure that your plan goes right. But if there's a bump in the road, and, and as you talked about the margin call, if something goes askew, and you need to come up with more than you might have wanted to. Is this something for everybody, or is it just a select few that should be doing something like this? Margin calls, yes. very, well, very few people should be. If anybody, basically. Right. right. Do, it's, it's not something sounds like that you recommend all the time. No, not, don't recommend it at all. Really? At all. Don't really know what this means, but it's a cardinal sin. Okay. That's that's right. Right. But it, right. it's a useful... I'll explain that to you later. Okay. It, it's, it's a useful thing for certain people at certain times to do certain things, but it's not for 99.99% of the people as a rule. Okay, we have uh, one more uh, before we go to break when we're talking about the common mistakes that you want to avoid when it comes to your finances. And this is, <laughs> speaking of not doing margin buying, trying to get rich quick, which I guess a lot of people have delusions of that or dream about that, but what do you actually mean, Stan, when you say trying to get rich quick? Well, it's, it's the margin buying, it's buying the penny stocks, it's uh, you know saying, okay, I'm going to uh, uh, borrow this money from here and I'm going to go down to Atlantic City and all goes on red or green. And you know, you, you just, or you, you're buying all those lottery tickets and you're trying to, you know, it just, it just doesn't happen most of the time. It and the just, worst thing is you see on TV, oh, somebody just won the Powerball for 130 million yeah, in well, Philadelphia and everybody says, well, I got to go out and buy a Powerball. Yeah, well, but, but that was one person. You know what the odds are of winning the lottery? Is it, what is it, like one in five million or something? Zil it's even more. Even more than even that? More, yeah. Even more. Yeah, we use the theory of get rich slowly. That's th right. Right? That, exactly. So consistently, Correct. gradually build up your nest egg. So Work much. hard, put the, you know, foc get focused and put away money each and every month. Okay. Every single check, some of it should go into some right. sort of saving program. So if there's no message that you got here tonight on the show, do not try to get rich quick. That's what you learned. But we have more to talk about here on the show. With Stan and Lee Malotsky, I'm your host, John DeMassey. It is Malotsky on Money. We're here every week at this time. Yes, we have plenty more to talk about, and we've got some questions from folks who have watched the show before. We'll go over those and more right after these words. Stay with us. Since 1958, the SHM Financial Group has been providing sound financial insights and strategies for people just like you. Founded by Stan Malotsky, the SHM Financial Group believes in safety, security, and preservation of principal. For more information on how the SHM Financial Group can help you, contact them at 1-800-MONEY-SHM. That's 1-800-666-3974. Or visit them at shmfinancial.com.
Call us to discuss the reverse mortgage concept. If you should decide to proceed, you're required to go through a 60-minute phone or office interview. We will provide you with a list of HUD counselors you can call who will provide you with the counseling. Call us at 1-855-HUD-REVERSE. That's 1-855-483-7383. Welcome back to Malotsky on Money with Stan and Lee Malotsky. I'm your host, John DeMassey. Tonight we are discussing avoiding the common mistakes when it comes to your finances. And we hope that you're writing down and learning some things tonight about what not to do and what to do when it comes to your overall financial picture. We have one more to go over and then we have some questions from folks who have watched our show previously. And this is not taking credit card debt seriously. And unfortunately, Stan, a lot of people don't take it seriously. A lot more do, though. I mean, it seems to be with all the publicity that the credit card debt burden has uh, thrown at people, more and more people do take it a little more seriously than what they did before. And fortunately, now when you get the credit card statement, it says if you pay this out, uh, it'll take you this amount of time to pay off this debt, and you realize you'll be 126 years old by the time you fully pay off if you pay that minimum balance. So. People yeah. are observing that and are taking care of that. But when you look at the interest rate that they charge on the consumer on the debt, it, you really don't want to do that. Didn't they call that loan sharking years ago? They still do. <laughs> they still Certain do. parts where you grew up. <laughs> right, that's where right. I grew up. <laughs> that's, yes, on yes. that corner you could always take that's care right. of that. Same that's thing. right. So just take credit card debt seriously. Okay, we have some questions. And these are from folks who have uh, either watched the show or from some of our seminars. And this is a question from Debbie, who is in Reading, Pennsylvania. She said, can you tell me something about credit cards? My husband says we should refinance our house and pay off all of our credit cards. We owe about $30,000 and have at least that, if not more, in equity in our home. I say we should wait because our mortgage is affordable and we're making minimum monthly payments on the credit cards. I don't want to get into any more debt. Can you help us settle this argument? <laughs> Lee? <laughs> A marital discussion. <laughs> wow, what do you say? I, as, as, if you can get, eliminate the credit card debt. Debt is debt. If it's credit card debt or a, a, the debt on your home. <clears throat> Personally, I would take the equity you would, from You the would house take the equity out, refinance, and pay off the credit card. I would. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because because you're, you're, you'll never catch up to that 30000 uh, 30000 is a lot of money, isn't it, for a credit card? That's a lot. Yeah. That's a Or normal. High, yeah, yeah, right. That's right. a pretty high amount. Right. So you want to eliminate that in today's, if you can, refinance before interest rates really, really start to move up. They really started to move up lately, but you know, not that the sky's the limit, but the, before it's too late, take a look at refinancing and paying, getting rid of the high debt. And I understand that you have an entity that you work with and they can help people with refinancing that's, and mortgages. That's a good that possibility, kind of yes. We yeah, do okay. have a mortgage um, company that we are affiliated with. And they could kind of maybe walk this person through that yes. and say, here's what you yeah. can do. Just and, call us at the main right. number. Okay. Yeah. All right. Uh, we have another question here from uh, folks who have been watching our show. Harold in Philadelphia says, I saw your show a few weeks ago about college planning. I've set aside about $10,000 for my grandson for college. He's now 10. My son and his wife have done nothing so far for his college savings. I'm very concerned. Is there something I can do additionally, and how can I get them to start a savings plan? Stan? <laughs> that, it's good luck. I yeah. mean, good luck. I mean, it, at 10 years old, it's time they really should start, you know, looking at whether it's a 529 plan or some sort of plan to get help for that particular 10-year-old now to go to college. And if the grandparents can do more, then they should be doing more. And maybe a 529 kind of plan or a custodian account or certain kind of different plans that are prepaid plans that are available, we talked about on our previous show. These are things that people have to be aware of that it's going to cost a lot of money to send that 10-year-old to college. Well, well remember, said, I'm yes. sorry, remember with the 529 plan, even though the grandparent puts it in for the benefit of the grandchild who's 10, it's still the grandparent's money. They yes. own that asset. Yeah, they yes. own that. So right. the only difference is if they take it out and there's a gain, they put $20,000 into a 529 plan and it grows to 35000 and they decide, you know what, we really need this money for ourselves. They, they can get, take it, right? They can take it. Okay. No well, penalty, but they'll pay the taxes on the gain. Which they would have paid if they had it in their own name in the first place. So, right. So, so great planning, use 529 plans, explore it a little further. Now, if the, the, the child is 10, so he's going to school, 
in, let's say, seven years, mm -hmm. roughly, all right, and they've got $10,000, I mean, they got a lot of catching up to do. Do they try to double up? How do they try to make up for lost time? Well, that's what they have to do. Okay. I mean, 10000 you know, today's interest rates, you know, might be worth fifteen when the child is ready to go to college. Well, maybe there's a college there that can afford that he can afford that, or a, a community college, and then on to college. And again, that's part of a whole discussion about how you finance uh, college costs in today's world. And we have to repeat our college planning show because yeah. we got a lot of reaction to that show. But there's there's some great things that are available. There's all kinds of aid that is available if people know how to go about getting that aid. And we have a division that we're creating that basically helps people do exactly that. All right, we have one more question before we leave you tonight here on Malotsky on Money. And this one comes from Bill in Collingswood, New Jersey. He says, I'm getting married in 2014. Both my fiance and I have never been married before and we're in our early 30s. Everyone tells us to make sure we discuss finances and that we are both on the same page. My fiance is always reluctant to do that. Then when I brought up the issue of a prenup, she went crazy thinking that I was trying to get one over on her. We both have very little in terms of money, but my question is, do we really need a prenup? Lee? If they We're making you the marital expert here sure. tonight. <laughs> um, I would defer the question to you as a marital expert, but in their case, if they have very little, no. But what they should do is have an open discussion about how they feel about money and what's it all about and how, how they divide up the bills and how they divide up the assets as they start accumulating. So it, it can only get worse if you don't discuss it and put it openly on the table. The, the perfect way to resolve that kind of a situation is for the, the potential husband to say, well, we're going to get married, we need a will. And they sit down with an attorney and they tell the attorney beforehand, or he tells the attorney beforehand, bring up whether or not you think the prenup makes any kind of sense. And let them, let the attorney give them the legal ramifications of doing it or not doing it. So in that case, it's an unbiased Absolutely. observer, a third party, sure. explaining, well, maybe you do need something like this, regardless of how much you have or don't have. Sure, and even let the wife pick the attorney, who they That's go to. You know, it's That's why you've been married for what, 55 years? Not quite. Not quite? Not quite. Close yes, to. Okay. Yes. I mean, that's, that's why you, because <laughs> you've solved all these problems before, right? Uh, let's, yes, we've worked on them. Yes. yes. <laughs> it's an ongoing process. Right. Lee, any final thoughts on how people can avoid the mistakes that we've talked about tonight? Here you on just show? really sit down and do your homework before you jump into the pool. Make sure that the pool has water in it before <laughs> you go jumping in. And openly discuss it with your spouse and, and just have a, have a bit of a plan. Okay. And with that, we are going to put the wraps on another edition of Malotsky on Money. Don't forget, you can call Stan or Lee or any member of the SHM Financial Group. You can email them. You can go on their website, and they'll be happy to talk to you and give you as much information as you need. For Stan and Lee Malotsky, I'm your host, John DeMassey. As always, a pleasure. Thanks for watching. Good night, Alexa. Good night, Jenna. Talk to you next time right here on Malotsky on Money. Take care. what your risk tolerance is when it comes to your investments? Do you know exactly what you have in your portfolio? The SHM Financial Group have developed a very important program called the Financial Stress Test. It's simple, quick, and can help you in your future financial plans. Contact the SHM Financial Group to schedule it. Offices in Collingswood, Voorhees, and Lakehurst, New Jersey. Call 1-800-MONEY-SHM. That's 1-800-666-3974. Call us to discuss the reverse mortgage concept. If you should decide to proceed, you're required to go through a 60-minute phone or office interview. We will provide you with a list of HUD counselors you can call who will provide you with the counseling. Call us at 1-855-HUD-REVERSE. That's 1-855-483-7383. Throughout our working years, we accumulate as many retirement nest eggs as possible. The problem is, not much attention is given to the color of the eggs. Do you know how much of your assets should be allocated to each color? At our firm, we have a system that helps you allocate your retirement nest eggs correctly. We have a simple way for you to group your retirement assets into red, yellow, and green money. Give us a call today and we will help you sort and label your retirement nest eggs, giving you a clear picture of the color of your retirement.